Hi, this is Wayne, and today I'm going to try and give you a little bit of breakdown as to how much does it cost to learn to fly. This is a question that gets asked time and time again, and in all honesty, it's actually quite a hard question to answer. Everyone's situation is different, where you choose to learn to fly, how you choose to learn to fly, what you decide to learn to fly. All of these things are going to have some bearing on how much it costs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through what it costs me and hopefully give you a few little pointers so that when it comes to working out the costs for you, you have a better idea as to what it really does cost. The first thing you need to do before you start to learn to fly is go on a trial flight. Go and find out if you actually like learning to fly. A trial flight is basically half an hour or an hour. I'd always go for the hour. You, an instructor, in a plane of your choice, well, I say of your choice, it's down to the school really, you're not going to get a trial flight in a Spitfire or a B-52, it's going to be something simple, a PA-20A, a Cessna 152, something of that description. And the idea of a trial flight is to give you some idea of what it really feels like to be in a small aircraft, which is completely different to a large wide-bodied or something you might go on holiday on, and gives you an opportunity to play with the controls, the instructor is going to be beside you, they're going to be hovering over the controls, so you're not going to do anything that's going to damage the plane or damage yourself, but you get some idea as to what it feels like. You get to look out, you might even get a certificate and some pictures at the end of it, and it's a great thing. The good news with a trial flight is, generally the hour or so that you've actually used as a trial flight is loggable because you had an instructor next to you, so you have just done your first hours of flying. Trial flights vary in terms of cost, in my case, it was about £200. So that was the first £200 I spent, and quite frankly, that was the start of everything. Next, we have the biggest and the most expensive part of learning to fly, and that is paying for an aircraft and paying for an instructor. Now, the first thing I would say, never ever pay up front, particularly if you're going to pay large sums of money. Flying schools are businesses, and unfortunately, in this day and age, businesses do fail. So please don't pay large sums of money to a flying school, even if they're going to offer you a tiny discount, and sometimes it's like 5% because if they fail, the last thing you're going to get back is your money. So always try and be a little bit cautious. Look at what they're offering. The first thing you've got to decide is what type of aircraft you're going to fly. The two main groups are low wings, things like a PA-28, and high wings, things like Cessnas 152s, 172s, etc. The criteria are slightly different. One is more expensive than the other. The PA-28s are more expensive than a Cessna, generally, but it can vary depending on your school. The reason I went for PA-28s is, quite frankly, I'm a larger guy, and sticking me in a 152 with an instructor and enough fuel to actually go flying was going to be quite interesting. So I went with a PA-28. Generally, when you're hiring a plane, it comes with the instructor, so you pay a single price for plane and instructor, but it does depend on the school. For me, it was a fixed hourly rate, and this hourly rate is based on what they call breaks on to breaks off. So as soon as the aircraft start moving, the clock starts ticking. As soon as the aircraft stops moving at the end of the flight, that's when the clock stops. Now generally, my school booked two hour blocks and you expected to have the aircraft for an hour in the middle. So you had half an hour to start, which was the time for the briefing. You then had an hour flying time, and then you had half an hour allocated for the debrief. But again, your school might be slightly different. All the booking went through an electronic booking system, so I could book up in advance, so I knew when I was going to fly. Instructor-wise, I was allocated an instructor at the start, and for most of my training, I had the same instructor. Personally, I found that worked really well. You can spend a lot of time in a very small, confined area with your instructor. Get on with them. If you don't get on with your instructor, talk to them, or talk to the school. Change instructors. Remember, at the end of the day, you're the one paying the money for the lessons. If you're not getting on with your instructor, that's the time to start to talk to people. Further on in your training, you might find that other instructors brought in. We had mock tests, we had instructors who would sign us off for particular milestones, like going solo. Then you have an instructor at the end who's the chief flying examiner, or flying examiner for some description, who does the final skills test. That generally is not going to be the person who's been doing the instruction all the way through. So, total-wise, I was paying £224 an hour for PA-28 plus an instructor. Bear in mind, Elstree is based in London. Prices are generally higher than a lot of the other areas in the country. And if you want to save money and you can, then consider aircraft like the C-152, which was cheaper. The minimum requirement is 45 hours. 
the average seems to be between 60 and 80. So when you're budgeting for flight costs, take that into consideration. I also have 1,700 pounds of solo flight. This was from when I was doing my cross countries and my solo consolidation. And this is charged at a slightly lower rate because you don't have an instructor next to you. Next, we have travel. Now, my traveling time and the amount I spent on travel is actually a nominal amount. I live about 15 to 20 minutes away from my aerodrome, which is great. It means I can jump in the car, drive to the airfield and be ready to fly. But it's something you need to consider. If you're going to spend an hour traveling to an airfield, an hour traveling back, that's going to cost you more potentially than finding an airfield that was closer, but slightly more expensive. So take traveling time in, into consideration and also consider whether you have to pay parking at the other end. Some flight schools are in major international airports and parking is not going to be cheap. Although a lot of these schools will actually have some deal with the airfield. So you're not going to be paying the same amount you would if you're doing the short stay car park at Heathrow. Next, £120 for flight school membership. This covers more of the social side of the flight school. Technically, it also covers insurance for me when I'm doing solo hire and it's a yearly payment to the flight school. It also covers some of the barbecues and things like that that they do for their members. Next, we have landing fees. Landing fees are the fee that you pay to land. Quite simple, really. Most airfields do have landing fees. The larger the airfield, the more complex the airfield, generally the more expensive. I'm lucky the flight school that I was with, landing fees were incorporated into the hourly rate. So for flying in the circuit, flying at my local aerodrome, I didn't pay any landing fees. However, when I started to do landaways, that is flying to other aerodromes and training at other aerodromes, particularly for things like doing my cross countries, I had to pay a landing fee. So next in my spreadsheet is £950 for exams and ground school. I basically went to an intensive ground school for five days and managed to crack through all my exams. I'd actually spent about three months doing book work with a set of Pooley's books, but I actually found that my ability to absorb information is much better when I actually have someone in front of me and be able to ask questions and talk about particular aspects. There's a lot of online stuff out there now, and a lot of people go to various online schools for their training. I was just at the point where the CAA changed from old-fashioned question banks and paper exams into full online digital exams, so I had all of the new online stuff, including some very quirky questions questions that quite frankly weren't written very well and were basically meaningless but I still managed to crack through them in the end. Would I recommend going to ground school? Well for me personally it worked really well. I did do the book learning first so I did go to the ground school effectively using the ground school to bring me up to speed and finish off a couple of the topics that I didn't really understand by reading Pooley's books. I am aware that some people use ground schools to try and cram everything into a week and quite frankly I don't think that's doable. If you manage to pass an exam in a week without having done any background reading is that really a good understanding of the subject? Personally, I don't think so. Next up is £85 for the RT exam. The RT is a practical exam for radio telephony and is done with an instructor. Moving down my spreadsheet, we're now into medical territory. Now, trainee pilots have to have a medical, and there's basically two types. There's a class one medical, which is more intense and is designed for people who are going into commercial flight. So if you're intending to do your PPL and then go beyond PPL into commercial, get a class one done sooner rather than later. If you're looking, as I was, just for PPL flying, class two is perfectly adequate, covers everything that you need to do standard PPL flying. One thing I would suggest is get your medical done sooner rather than later. One of the problems that people sometimes find is they'll spend sums of money learning to fly, then they decide to get their medical. Most schools require you to have your medical done before you at least go solo. They do their medical, something gets flagged up and they have to stop. So they've wasted all that money learning to fly, now they've either got to have a break because they need to sort out whatever medical has flagged up, or Worst case scenario is the medical turns around and says, sorry, you're not going to be able to fly. It does happen. So get your medical done as soon as possible. If you're going for commercial, class one. If you're not going for commercial, class two. Something else to factor in, as you get older, the medical requirements change slightly. Once you're over 50, you now need a medical every year. And every two years, you need to have an ECG. 
Other things to add to the list, a chart. You need a chart. A chart is the roadmap of the skies and it's something that you'll spend hours and hours and hours poring over, drawing lines on. Generally the schools can provide you with a chart, they're 18, 19 pounds, but you can buy them from places like Pooley's. Don't forget, buy the chart for your area. There's three charts that cover the UK. They get replaced every single year. So a chart is only gonna last you a year. So if you're gonna buy anything secondhand, don't buy a secondhand chart. It's probably going to be out of date. Whilst we're on the subject of buying things, I bought a flight starter kit, which was around about £245, which was basically a flight bag, a load of books, a couple of rulers, a protractor, a knee board, and a few bits and pieces. And it was a good start, but there are cheaper ways of buying things. But for me, it was a case of buying it, having it in one package, and then proceeding on with my flying. Coming towards the end of my spending list and I have a headset and yes, I bought a Bose A20 which is probably the most expensive headset you can buy for flying. It's noise reduction. Yes, they're expensive. I love them. As long as I remember to switch them on, they're great. It changes your flying in so much that you actually get to hear better because you're not constantly dealing with the drone of the engine in the background. You can buy cheaper headsets. You can buy headsets that don't have automated noise reduction. And most flying schools will actually allow you to hire headsets from them. So my suggestion possibly is the first two or three flights, just borrow or hire the headset from the school. Then when you're more certain that you're going to carry on training, then consider buying a headset. When you finally have done all your training, the school will turn around to you and say, congratulations, we want to put you up for your skills test. Now, the skills test is something that every pilot looks forward to and possibly dreads because it's the culmination of all your training. Once you pass your skills test, you have your PPL and you have that great little license. You're paying for the flight examiner and you're paying for the aircraft. Expect two to three hours of flying time. And hopefully at the end, he or she will turn around to you and go, congratulations, you've passed your skills test. You might have passed your skills test, but now you've got to fill in a whole pile of documentation and send the princely sum of £196 to the CAA, and hopefully in two or three weeks, they'll send you a license. A few tips here. One, get your school to check all your paperwork, because I guarantee you'll manage to send the paperwork and something will be missing, something won't be ticked, and then you have a delay getting things back. And the way the CAA seems to work is if there's any possibility of something being wrong, they restart the clock and everything has to go back to the beginning and then you have to go through the whole process again. One little thing I will say is make sure when you've done your RT exam, the documentation for that you send in at the same time as the documentation for your PPL. That way you don't have to pay an additional fee to have your RT added onto your license at a later date. And hopefully if everything's well, two to three weeks, the CAA will send you a nice little blue wallet with your license in. Congratulations, you're now a fully fledged pilot and now you have to spend even more money carrying on flying. But that's another subject. The total for me has come to 28,326 pounds and a few pence, which is a lot of money. But the thing is that was spread over 14 months. I enjoyed every moment of it. Well, I enjoyed most of it. In fact, yeah, I did enjoy big chunks of it and other bits were hard and I was tearing my hair out, but that's the nature of learning to fly. The key is always budget for more. My adage is double what you think it is and add 50%. And if you think that 45 hours is the minimum required, 45 hours, double that, it's 90 hours, add 50%. The number of hours I did to pass my PPL is quite close to that. It was within my budget. There are a few other things I haven't mentioned that sort of come into budgeting for flying. If you're doing landaways, buy your instructor a cup of tea, maybe, they might like that. Bear in mind also, if you're gonna to travel to and from an airfield, you are sometimes gonna to get to the airfield and find your lessons canceled. That's effectively a wasted trip. Possibly talk to your school and talk about doing ground school instead. I also paid for a few other little extras, like I had a couple of apps that I use, Sky Demon, they were down as ancillary costs. Hopefully this has given you some idea as to how much does it cost, well, how much did it cost me, and give you some pointers as to how much it might cost you. I would go through everything step by step and try and work out roughly what it's going to cost you and then budget for it. One of the worst things you can do is run out of money halfway through your training. You'll find that if you space your training out too much, you'll end up spending more time going over what you did in the last lesson and less time doing something new, which is basically gonna cost you more in the long run. 
I aim to try and book two flights a week, expecting at least one of them to be cancelled due to weather or due to other reasons, and it generally worked out for me. But it's always going to be down to your personal circumstances. Don't forget everyone's situation is going to be different, so just because I did something in a certain way and it's cost me a certain amount doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the same for you. Biggest thing is talk to people, get out there, explore, use the internet, go and talk to schools, go and talk to other pilots, get personal recommendations, and fundamentally enjoy the journey. I hope this podcast has helped. If it has, please consider leaving a review and consider following for more episodes on my journey on how not to learn to fly. Don't forget, please do not use the internet for flight instruction. We'll only teach you how to crash. Thanks for listening, and please remember, be safe and have fun. Bye.